I'm glad so many of you were able to make it here on such short notice. And I trust you'll tell those who couldn't make it about what you see. I have something very important to show you. Because of our mayor's growing hostility toward returnists, I had a hollow recorder planted in his office. Wow, like Don't judge me for that. You're about to see why it was the right decision. This was recorded yesterday. For what purpose have you summoned me again, Mayor? Ambassador, you've been lying to us. About what, Mayor? The whole mission, where we're going. I see. Ambassador, this is a powder keg we're sitting on. All those people out there, they've spent their whole lives in service of this mission, and they know many more generations of their families will have to do the same. What do you think will happen if they find out the mission is based on a lie you told us? Not a lie, simply an omission of an important detail. I don't see it that way, and they sure as hell won't. Heck, I guess we shouldn't even be calling you Centaurians? I resided on Proxima Station for several years, so I think I have as much right to call myself a Centaurian as anyone. But no, I suppose strictly speaking our species name should translate for you to a derivative of your name for our true home system. So what are you? Do you really think I'm likely to fall for that? Can't blame me for trying. So, explain yourself. Explain the purpose of this deception. Mayor, the universe can be a dangerous place. When I was young, and with all this hibernation travel I do that was quite a few centuries ago, but when I was young, this planet where we now have our Proxima Station was home to a civilization whose transmissions we picked up. This was a highly advanced civilization, far more advanced than our own. We found evidence of extensive terraforming and a strong artificial magnetic field to protect against Proxima Centauri's flares. Our scientists have never understood how your planet stayed habitable, orbiting a flare star. Their planet. But by the time our first expedition arrived, this civilization, comprised of colonists from some other system we suppose, had been obliterated by an asteroid impact. We calculated it was a very small asteroid traveling more than half the speed of light. This is an unthinkable scenario in the natural universe, so we believe it was an intentional strike. We transmit from there because a place that has already been revealed and destroyed suffers no further risk. The Dark Forest? I don't understand. Before first contact, we had a problem we called Fermi's Paradox. The question of why no other civilization in all the galaxy had made contact with us yet. One proposed answer was that our galaxy is like a dark forest filled with hunters where each civilization is trying to avoid detection by any other for fear of immediate destruction by relativistic projectiles like the asteroid you've described. And when a civilization learns of another, it wipes them out to maintain security. Yes, this may be the situation. We're not sure, but we don't wish to risk billions of lives until we're sure. Why didn't you warn us? It's too late for Earth. Your transmissions continue outward at the speed of light. You can't stop them. We don't know how long your planet has. We aren't sure you'll be targeted at all. So we saw no advantage to seeding panic and potentially causing you to withdraw from us. Then you'll understand why it's critical that we keep all this under wraps. If the rest of our people learned any of what we've been discussing, learned that our destination isn't your home planet, or that Earth might be in danger, it could spark chaos. Agreed. For too long, we've allowed all our decisions to be made by this duplicitous mayor who plots our fate behind our backs. For too long, we've allowed aliens to trick us into wasting our whole lives. No more. It's time for the people to rise up and seize our own destiny. It's time to head back to Earth on a new mission to save our home planet. QuietPlease.org presents 
253 Matilda. At the turn of the 22nd century, the asteroid 253 Matilda was converted into an interstellar spaceship. Now 92 years into a 780-year mission, generations have come and gone. Episode 5, Unhappy Returns. These feelings of alienation from yourself, I believe it's what we call depersonalization disorder. It's a feeling of detachment from your own mental processes. It's not unusual. The way I came to have these feelings is certainly unusual. Granted, but we may still be able to treat it in the usual way. And how's that? Sometimes cognitive behavioral therapy, but in your case, I recommend psychodynamic therapy. How does that work? I'll attempt to facilitate your achieving a deeper understanding of your mental processes, which should help you gain more insight into why you're experiencing these feelings. But we'll take that up next session. Right now, I want to hear how you've been doing socially since the accident. I've been feeling really disconnected there too. Marissa and I have been arguing more. My father hasn't checked in at all, and I don't think he cared if I survived or not. And I'm kind of pissed about that. Maybe the two disconnections are related. Do you feel like nobody cares about what you're going through? Well, our former detective cares, but his interest just feels creepy, so I wish he didn't care. And Marissa cares, but in a domineering way. Everybody either cares too much or not at all. Nobody does it right. That's interesting. And I feel so lost. Like, everything I took for granted my whole life was a facade. And now the walls have crumbled and I don't know what to do. None of it means anything. It's normal to experience a loss of innocence at your age. A revelation that life isn't what you thought it was and your dreams were just dreams. Sometimes it can be very sudden, triggered by something like your trauma. So you're telling me my problem is is I'm young and I'll grow out of it? No, I'm just trying to relate your experience into a common frame of reference to show you that it's possible to get through it. There's nothing common about my experiences. I'm literally the only person this has ever happened to in all history. My brain actually contains the tissues of two different people, my twin sister and myself. And that's why it could be helpful to reinterpret through the lens of more common experiences. We're at the end of our session now, though. So what do you think? Am I well enough to resume my duties? I'll clear you to return to work, but not because I think you're well. I worry keeping you isolated could make things much worse. Maybe getting back into the swing of things and feeling useful will help you overcome these thoughts. What can I do for you, Jesus? Are you feeling ill? I'm fine, Doctor. Actually, I wanted to talk to you about something else. What's that? Have you heard about the Mayor's deception? How we're not actually heading to the Centaurian homeworld? Word has reached me, yes. Nothing really surprises me from this, Mayor, but it's a new low. Some of us are organizing to do something about the problem. We'd like you with us. I can't say I'm a returnist. I couldn't care less about Earth. But there also doesn't seem much point in continuing this mission that's based on lies. What I do know is that we need new leadership. Leadership that'll be more open-minded. You side with us, and I can promise you full support for your research and experiments. Every avenue of study the mayor has nixed over the years. You can start back up. Huh. That's very encouraging to hear. I'll send you my proposed revisions to the medical ethics law. I'll make your proposals a priority as soon as I have the power to do so. Doctor, if you if, if you had just a small team of poorly armed people to go up against the mayor with, what do you think would be the most vital asset to realistically seize? You know, I don't think you'd need to do much to bring change around here. 
If you had one of the Centaurians as a hostage, the mayor wouldn't dare to move against you, and the rest of the Centaurians wouldn't dare to move against you, and you could take one who's in a hibernetic suspension pod, helpless to resist you. Then you'd have a pod too, and I'd die to get a close look at that technology, really take one apart. Maybe I could make it work for humans, help you get back to Earth in your lifetime without relying on that magic new propellant long shot Peters has been going on about. And we could teach those Centaurians that there's consequences for taking us on an 8th century wild goose chase. I think you've got something there, Doctor. I'll sketch out a plan. It's not a bad plan if those improvised explosives work. They work. We tested in the mines. Easy to pass them off as normal blasting there. Well then, I'm with you. I'm taking a risk by trusting you, Amadi. But Axe Law Enforcement is the closest thing we've got to tactical experience here. You know I've got no love for the mayor. To tell you the truth, I don't care if we go to Earth or Proxima or nowhere. I just think we need new leadership and new ideas to replace this stale system of government. And you're the only option for that right now. Good enough for me for now. I think the Ambassador, the one who's awake, is a remaining obstacle. I'd rather not kill him, that could complicate our position. But we'll never overpower him. I heard they're three times as strong as people, and I don't think stun guns would work on them. We've got to get him out of the way somehow. I've got an idea for that. I'm going to try to arrange a fake summons from the mayor to lure the ambassador away. Should give us five or ten minutes. It yeah, should be enough if we have the timing down. How are you going to pull it off? I've got somebody with connections who owes me a favor. You shouldn't be going back to work yet. I want to. It's boring not having anything to do. There's lots of housework you could be doing. You know what I mean. Something meaningful. You should change your apprenticeship. What? Why not join us in communications? We haven't had an apprentice since Sanders transferred. Why? You don't really want to keep working for Peters, do you? The guy almost got you killed. Next time, he'll succeed. For the last time, sis, it was my fault. He warned me not to touch anything until he said to. Fine. I'll see if I can get a discount on your funeral by reserving a head. Flint, I wasn't expecting to see you hopping around already. I'm ready to work. Anything that only requires one good leg. You can help me design this print job, a part for the reactor. Sure. ever wonder who you are, boss? How do you mean? Like your purpose. My family and my work are my purpose. See if you can fix the inner radius to get within 0.02 tolerance in the simulation. I just don't seem to be on top of my game today. But if you were of two minds about something... I'd try to keep my options open as long as I could. Unfortunately, people tend to make that difficult. I hate being pushed into irrevocable decisions I'm not ready for. There. That looks good. Okay, let's print a quick test article. Glad to see you're up and about, Larissa. Be careful, Amadi. Don't touch anything, and keep back from the railing. Hmm. Looks okay at first glance. Hello, Detective. I'm not a detective anymore. You're going to have to start using my name. What can we do for you, Amadi? I meant my first name. Look, I don't want to lead you on. Fine. I get it. Could you do me a favor? What kind of favor? I'm playing a little practical joke on a friend, and to make it work, I need a message transmitted for communications at just the right moment. I didn't know you had friends or a sense of humor, Detective. There's a lot you don't know about me. 
And this seems like something for my sister. She works in communications. She has a rather strong dislike for me at the moment, so I can't ask her. Yeah, I know all about landing on Marissa's shit list. But, but Larissa, as her sister, you could visit her there and slip my data cube into the queue. It has the message and timing encoded on it. Will you do it? I suppose I owe you that much for saving my life. Sure, I'll do it. If Marissa gets in trouble for it, that'll be a bonus. Oh, you must be Salish's husband. I'm Dr. Peters, yes. I remember you from your psyche veil, but I can't place your name. Jesus Maradona. Is Salish home? Salish, it's for you. What brings you here, Jesus? Can we speak privately for a few minutes? <sighs> Fine. I'll go see what the kids are up to at the rec center. So what's this about? You know you're something of a hero now, Salish. To who? Returnists. You've raised the possibility that we might be able to get home in our own lifetimes. I guess I did. I can't promise that'll work out, and I don't decide where we go if it does. Can we count on you, Salish? It's time to make a choice. You're either with me, or you're with the mayor. I'm not one to rock the boat. Your boat is heading full speed for an iceberg, and your captain has been lying about it. The only question is if you're willing to help change our course. I'm not a soldier. But, but you do know how to make explosives. It's not very different from rocketry. Do you think you could make that powerful new ore you discovered into a controllable explosive charge? It could be so much better than what anyone else can cobble together. I won't. That's too far. If you were with us making advanced weapons, the mayor would see the writing on the wall and back down. You're talking preparations for war here, Jesus. I'd love to get home to Earth, and I hope you can get us on course, but I have a family to protect. I'm not putting myself in the middle of a war. Fine, fine. You want to be a fence-sitter? You can try it for as long as you can. When the time comes, remember who your friends are, and stay away from the Arboretum tomorrow. I shouldn't be telling you this, but I don't want to see you get hurt. Okay, we're all here. You've all been briefed. Hands up if you've got any last minute questions. Yes, Patel? Couldn't you find a few more recruits? Everyone who knows the plan is another security risk. If the mayor or Detective Seatang learned what we're up to, it would have been game over. Six is enough to get this job done, and we'll count on the rest of our supporters to help us from the outside once we're holed up in the Arboretum. And Dr. Stone is waiting for us in the Arboretum. Could the Centaurian section have any automated defenses? I've been in there, Patel. I didn't notice any sign of defenses on the inside. I think they believe their door will suffice, and they don't open it often. Ambassador 5, report to the mayor's office urgently. Repeat. Ambassador 5, report to the mayor's office urgently. That's our cue. Form up. Two columns. Let's go liberate ourselves. I'd like to go inside to um, perform repairs for a work crew. You do not have permission to enter. Please wait for Ambassador 5 to return. We'd rather not. There, I've set the charges. Antisocial behavior detected. Take cover! Defenses activated. Right off. Good work, Amadi. Cover! The tail's hurt. No time to worry about that. We'll take out those automated laser turrets. Quick! Set another explosive. Throw it. But the tail's right there. We can't get to him without losing more people. He's probably dead already. Set the charge. I can't blow him up. I've known you were not going to stop. I'll do it myself. Move! Move! In here! 
here, sir. Which one should we take? They're all the same. Just, just hurry. There. Ambassador Wong's pod is disconnected. Sanders, you help Amadi carry it. It only weighs five kilos. Don't forget inertia. You can still lose control of it. We don't want our prize damaged. Besides, you look a bit unwell. To the Arboretum! Everyone! You've been listening to 253 Matilda, Episode 5, Unhappy Returns. Created, written, produced, and directed by Paul Miram. The mayor is Roger Arnold. Dr. Stone is John Gauntz. Detective Arash Amadi is Paul Neeram. Judge Lee is Rachel Pulliam. Marissa Flint is Virginia Hargrove. Ambassador 5 is the eSpeak speech synthesizer. Chief Mech Salish Peters is David Loftus. Apprentice Mech Larissa Flint is Lindsay Townsend. Patel was David Feldman. Crowd noises included Emily Eichel and Paul Neerham. The announcer is Aaron Summonsby. Sound effects and music courtesy freesound.org and freepd.com. Additional music by audionautics.com. This program is licensed for free reuse and redistribution. Hear more episodes at quietplease.org slash 253.